Hello and welcome to Couple with a Scientist, a podcast by Loughborough University that interviews a different scientist each week about their academic journey to the top. We will discuss how they went from a confused teenager choosing A-level and equivalent subjects to a leader in their field, with plenty of weird and wonderful stories in between and golden nuggets of advice for those aspiring to get into science. As well as keeping your ears and brain entertained, we hope this podcast will dispel the myth that all scientists wear white lab coats and give you an insight into how vast the world of science really is. And because the makers of this show are painfully British, we'll be doing it all over a good cuppa. So stick the kettle on and settle in. So before we get stuck into this episode, a quick bit about your host. I'm Meg and I'm a PR and communications officer at Loughborough University and I'm also an aspiring scientist. I made the tough decision to return to university to pursue my love of biology and I found podcasts to be an incredibly helpful resource when making this decision, though slightly field specific. From health sciences to social sciences, we'll cover it all in this podcast and show you how vast science really is and hopefully you'll pick up a few tips and tricks along the way to help you on your journey to becoming a scientist. Joining us for today's episode is Dr Pooja Goddard, an expert in material science in the Department of Chemistry. Pooja's research focuses on computational studies of fundamental processes in complex materials at the atomic and quantum scale. She is a Royal Society Industry Fellow and the Director of Quality and Diversity in the School of Science, but more on that later. Um, So hi Pooja, welcome to the show. First of all, important question, what mug have you gone for today and what are you drinking? Uh, So I was going to bring a mug that said, I love mornings. Um, I just wish they came later in the day, but I haven't (laughs) because that that, that was at work. But I brought a mug that says, um, cake is breakfast for champions. And I've got hot water in there because it's afternoon and I'm trying to be decaf at the moment. So I I drink a lot of hot water. Love it. Um, So I've got a, it says Octopus. Oh, very nice. uh, Which I think is so cute. And I'm actually drinking hot squash. So we're all on the kind of hot water vibe today. Um, And we've also requested that you um, bring in some artifacts that relate to your work or your job. Um, Have you got anything interesting you can show us, please? Yeah, so I've got got quite a few things, actually. But I'm going to start with Sam Mm. and Eddie, who are my two materials buddies. Uh, I don't know if you can tell. That's Sam and that's Eddie. And the reason I know that is because he's got a little doodah on his nose. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and so Sam and Eddie go to me, uh, go with me to all the schools to do um, outreach uh, and things like that. And they sit in my office. And so there are, there are love for Teddies. Um, and then what I brought is some basic things that you can make a fuel cell out of. So this is a beaker. Uh, you've got some crocodile clips and wires. And I've got a couple of pencils in a, in a tub and some LED lights. So I'm just going to... And these are basic things that you can use to make um, a fuel cell. And you can have different colors of LED lights. Oh, so I'm not showing that very well. Uh, and then just some bicarbonate soda water and, and you can make a fuel cell. So those are my artifacts. <laughs> That's really cool. So could you tell us a little bit more about how you make the fuel cell with that? Yeah. So bicarbonate. Yeah, so then... you put water in the beaker, um, about half the beaker, throw in a teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda. Then you take your two pencils, and you connect your wires up. Sorry, should have been more prepared. <laughs> I put you very much on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so you take, usually if you use two different colours, it's helpful. So you take your wires and you connect up the pencils. And you also need a small battery. I don't have a battery with me, but you basically connect up this. And then you use the other side of the wire and you connect it up to the lights. Now, because it's an LED, the LED will light up, will move electrons only in one direction. So LED stands for light emitting diode. And that's a a fuel cell. And the idea is that you you use the battery to create hydrogen that is on your pencil tips. And then you use the hydrogen to power the LED light. And this is how a hydrogen fuel cell works. Fascinating. I love that little demo to kick off the show. Thank you. Um, so let's kind of get into the questions I have prepared that you are more prepared for. Thank you for um, <laughs> performing when I very much put you on the spot. <laughs> um, so you describe yourself as a material scientist. Can you explain what that means, please? Yeah, so basically I'm a scientist who uh, studies the properties of materials. Uh, this could be anything from... Um, wood to cloth to you know think about anything that 
contains matter, which is pretty much everything. My mug is, is a material, what the teddy bears are made of is material. And some of these are more fluid, uh, some of these are more um, solid, etc. So plastic is a material. So it's trying to understand the properties of those materials. So uh, what, what can we use them for? What are they good for? Uh, what are they not good for? And once we understand what they're good for and what parts of them make them good for what they, we think they are. For example, a mug is ceramic and that means it can, you know, it's heat, the heat, it's heat capacity can tell us whether the mug is going to get too hot for you to hold or not. Um, and those sort of properties can then tell you if you changed the material a little bit, can you make it more heat resistant or less heat resistant and things like that. So, so that's what a material scientist does. And I mean, you've kind of summarized it there, but why is this an important area of study, would you say? Um, mainly because it allows us to understand the properties that make a material more usable. So if we think about, for example, um, you know, man, when we first started, we figured out fire and then we were able to take materials like rocks and, and heat them up and figure out what we can get from those rocks, for example, and one of the things we discovered was metals because we were able to extract metals from rocks that have iron ore, for example, things like that. So it's trying to allow us to make use of materials in a more practical way that can better our world, basically. Are you looking at like future materials as well, like how we can and what kind of areas are you looking at there? I know we'll get into this more in the research, but I know we've kind of spoke about man at the beginning. I'm just wondering if man in the future comes into your research too. Yes, absolutely. So. Um, my research is actually very computational, so I don't wear a lab coat, I don't go into the lab, so I'm not studying materials from a very experimental point of view, but I study them using computers and simulations and modeling. And that allows me to look at current materials that they're using in energy technologies like batteries and fuel cells, but also future materials. So at the moment we work with lots of companies and other collaborators around the country where they're looking for future materials and we're able to predict whether what they're thinking of changing in their material will either with either work or not work absolutely sounds very interesting looking forward to talking about your projects more in more detail in a bit um so are there any misconceptions or assumptions that people have when you say you're a material scientist well it's mostly when i say that i'm a materials modeler um, because modeling as you can imagine can have many interpretations <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah so uh, so it's usually the modeling part of it that gets the that gets the misconceptions but generally people understand when we say material scientists the clues in the name is that we're looking at the science of materials basically so it's not it's not that misconceived <laughs> Great, so we'll discuss more about your research and applications shortly. Um, but first, I'd like to take it back a little bit. So I can't imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you, when you were growing up, that you wanted to be a materials scientist. Um, what did you want to do when you were younger? So I come from an Asian culture, uh, Asian background, and um, it was honed into me from very young. So I mean, two, three, four years old that I wanted to be a doctor and that is what I wanted to be actually was a medical doctor um so yeah that's what I wanted to be when I was younger still got the doctor title though so just yes exactly like pivot in field <laughs> um, exactly. and I read on your research profile that you grew up on the foothills of Mount Kenya what was that like so I quite literally grew up on the foothills of Mount Kenya um we lived in a small village um and from my veranda so we lived on the first floor and from our veranda you could basically see Mount Kenya on a very clear day like today. So uh, yeah, so what was it like? It was absolutely amazing. Um, I think at the time when I lived there, I didn't actually realize how lucky I was. But it's now that when I look back, I think, hmm, not many people can say they lived at the foothills of Mount Kenya. So yeah, I feel very lucky for having that. Really cool. Um, so let's talk about how you went from the foothills of Mount Kenya to Loughborough University, quite different, <laughs> different scenes there. Um, so can you talk to us a bit about your early education and how then your higher education and how we ended up here, please? So, um, as I said, we lived in a small village. It's now a town and actually has a university, which I'm very proud about. <laughs> but at the time, there was only one school in our village. And so I used to go to the nearest town um, to school, and that was about 30 kilometers away. Um, and so we, there was only one school bus that would take all the kids from our village to the schools. And it didn't matter whether you were three going to kindergarten or whether you were 
you know, 16 doing GCSEs or whatever, or, or national exams. So we all went in the same van. So my day used to be 6 a.m. till 6 p.m. Because of the roads, 30 kilometers used to take wow. us a good hour and 20 minutes to get to. So school used to start at eight and finish at five, the older schools. Um, my So yeah, um, very long days from a very young age. Um, but also a lot of interaction with older years, if that makes mm. sense. So for me, science was always the key. I loved science. I loved doing science experiments. I had great science teachers in primary school. So science was always the key. My parents, although they dropped out of school, were very aspirational for me. So they really always wanted me to do well in school. So they space was always made for me to study well. <laughs> so so that, was, uh, that was key. Um, when I got to secondary school, I went actually to Nairobi, um, which is the capital city. And that is... So one thing I haven't said is that in my primary school, I used to be one of maybe one of two Asian students in the class. Right. My friends used to be Africans. I, my, my village friends used to be Africans. You know, I used, I, I never saw myself as an Asian. I always saw myself as an African. Um, when I moved to secondary school, which was in the capital city, my father decided to put me in an Asian community school. And so I became one of, many Asians in the school and perhaps there was only one African in my school so for me there was a huge cultural shift mm -hmm. um, from identifying as an African to then now having to identify as an Indian um, and learning the Indian culture and Indian way of being right so it was a huge huge shift for me my secondary school was mixed because I hated it because I didn't have any of my usual friends things were very unfamiliar to me it was new territory um, again at at the time, I didn't realize what was happening. It's now on hindsight that I realize how effective that was. But um, secondary school was difficult because my teachers were also Indian. And a lot of my chemistry teacher in particular, when I was doing my choosing my GCSE subjects, told me not to choose chemistry because she didn't feel that I was good at chemistry. And she even told the other teachers to kind of discourage me from going for chemistry. Mm -hmm. There was one teacher, however, and he was of African descent. And he basically said, "Do you do what you want? You do what you enjoy doing." And um, and he taught me chemistry. I learned chemistry from him, and I still keep in touch with him. Um, oh, that's and, and so he believed in me, but she didn't. And she actually told me I, I couldn't do chemistry to save my life. So I defied that a little bit. So whenever I was told you can't do this, that's what I wanted to do. If that makes sense, that's the kind of child I was. <laughs> so so I did chemistry, maths, and physics at A levels. And then I came to the UK to um, to try and become a doctor, actually. But I soon very quickly realized that it was very expensive. So it was, you know, it was upwards of one hundred thousand pounds that my parents needed to find for me to become a doctor. So I then decided to do civil engineering um, only because my best friend had chosen civil engineering. There's no logic to this at all. There's no career guidance, I can promise you. Um, three days later into my civil engineering course, I, I realized I'm not very good at building bridges. So I spoke to my personal tutor and he asked me what my chemistry grades were and what, what my A-level grades were. And then basically walked me over to the chemistry department. And I started, you know, a few days later in the chemistry degree. And I never looked back, really. So did it just click as soon as you went to your chemistry degree? Like, this is the place. Uh, it didn't actually and I kept trying to get back to medical you know um, because that's what I always wanted to do I kept going trying to go back and say okay well if I couldn't be a doctor maybe I can do medical research um, but every time you know I, I believe in karma a little bit and mm -hmm. <laughs> and so every time I got you know the opportunities that came my way and I took them because of immigration mainly um, where I couldn't or the choice was not always uh, the same or, or as fair as as it could have been um, I I then just went with the flow so whatever opportunity came my way I just took it after that and, and here I am so <laughs> well first of all I think you've um, showed that teacher who said you were never gonna succeed in chemistry so good for you <laughs> um, but yeah that's really really interesting about kind of how your road to where you are has been very unconventional and that's part of the reason I like this show to show people that you know you don't have to have a set plan you will end up where you're meant to be eventually um so when you got to the UK which university did you study at so I was at Coventry University for my first degree and they were closing the chemistry course down which I didn't realize at the time but when I got to the final year I was the only MCHEM in my class 
um, after that, they, you know, they'd stopped taking more MCAMs, if you like, in the fourth, so the master's program. Um, but I did manage to go to GlaxoSmithKline, and I was up against other students, and I never thought I would get a placement in GlaxoSmithKline. I did, you know, again, defying the odds. Um, and then, so I did a placement in Ware halfway through my degree. And I came back and I did a PhD at Warwick University. And again, it was in, that's where I got introduced to computational chemistry. I never, I never knew what computational chemistry was before right. that. And then I went off to Sweden. I had a, a research assistant job in Sweden for three and a half years after my PhD. And that was a completely different project to my PhD project. Um, so my PhD project was looking at oil drilling fluids, uh, very materials. Um, my, P, my postdoc position in Sweden was about trying to find a new way of diagnosing malaria without right. injecting blood out. So at the moment, you still inject blood out to, and, you know, to look under a microscope. We were trying to find a non-invasive technique for um, diagnosing malaria. So that was my postdoc. And then I came back and I started at Bath as a research officer. Um, and I stayed in Bath for four years. And I, that's where I started looking at batteries and fuel cells. And those, that's where my energy theme started, if you like. So still all computational because I was now fully trained. And then I moved to Huddersfield because I wanted to start my own independent research career. And then three years later, I joined Loughborough as my first lectureship and my first permanent position. Oh, that's, you've been all over. I love yeah, that. Yeah, I'm not a nomad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's quite a journey. Um, have you collected some kind of fun or unusual stories along the way? Or are there really any standout moments for you, like unusual research projects that you could share with us? Um, so the one I always talk about, um, which people find quite fascinating, is that I I love catnapping. This is how I survive the day. <laughs> so so most afternoons I will I will like you know after lunch I used to take a catnap. I can't afford to do it anymore because there's so many meetings. But um, I've grown up, I think. Um, <laughs> but when I was doing my PhD, for example, I had a little sleeping bag under my desk, and every lunchtime I would take a little twenty minute nap. And my, my PhD supervisor's passed away, bless him, but um, he never realized that I used to take a cat nap and he would come to the desk. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, I graduated and, and afterwards I told the story and he said, I never knew you used to cat nap under the desk. He said, I used to come and look for you and never find you. And I always thought you were out of the office, you know, you might have gone for a walk or something. But no, I was, because I'm small as well, I'm less than five foot, I could fit under a, a you know, a desk quite comfortably, so... I think that's genius. I think you could <laughs> normalise having a little nap underneath your yeah, desk absolutely. after lunch. <laughs> I think it's become standard with desks, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Have a little hammock underneath. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. So as it sounds like you've had lots of kind of career highs. And again, we'll talk about the research part later. Um. But have you faced many lows or have there been any difficulties? I'm quite keen to hear you mentioned that immigration was something that kind of steered your course I'm quite keen to hear about that as well and if that was kind of a bit of a barrier or a roadblock at times absolutely um so there's several aspects to this actually and immigration comes into it a little bit so I come from an Indian descent you know my ancestry is Indian um they never married African so I'm pure Indian actually um although I'm fourth generation born in Kenya um and so there was this African Asian conflict going on as, as, I, as I mentioned before. But then when I came to England, um, there was now a third dimension of being British um, that came into it. So there were struggles to try and find the right partners, the right you know, marriage partners, things like that. So I struggled to find, I was either too Indian for some families, I was either too African for others, and I was either too British or too educated for others. So right. I never quite fitted in with, you know, there was never one, there, there was always something that somebody could find to say, you're not good enough for, a, for our family. Um, and because of the culture I come from, you marry into the family, you don't really marry the person. So there was that always aspect of don't quite fit into the family. So I was, a, I was always in this cultural limbo, if you like, of, you know, African, Indian or British. I didn't quite really understand where I sat. Um, and I still don't. I still sort of flip flop between those. Um, immigration played a huge role because, of course, I was it took me 15 years to become naturalized in Britain. And 
it costed me almost twenty thousand um, pounds to do that. So every you know every year or every two years, I had to go back into applying for a visa, justifying my existence. So there was lots of lows in that as well, and I'm I'm still quite bitter about it that I had to pay so much money to become a British citizen. So when I get tainted as you know, when I hear things like oh, you're, you know, immigrants take our jobs and things like that. I think it, it really um, connects with me a little bit because, you know, yes, we do come, we work hard, but we also, we, we're not here to take jobs. We're just here to make a better living, if that makes sense. And it, it's not free for us. It costs us a lot of money to be British. So, so yeah, there are lots of lows uh, in, in that regard. Um, in terms of academic life, um, so to, to bring it back to the profession of academia, um, I never really experienced microaggressions and sort of aggressive behavior until I started to get a little bit senior. So it's only recently that I've started to experience microaggressions and things. So those have been a, a bit hard to bear as well. Until then, until you're a postdoc, you're still very protected and you sort of just do the research and it's it's a blissful life, to be honest, and you, mm. you don't realize how blissful it is until it's gone away and you look back and you think, mm, I wish I could be a postdoc again. But mm. once I started climbing the ladder, there was microaggressions because I started to speak my mind a little bit. My confidence was growing and people didn't necessarily, I didn't always fit with the status quo. Um, so I was sort of challenging leadership, challenging their decision making processes, things like that. And I still face them on a daily basis, but you start to get better at dealing with them. How how do you deal with that? It, it's just it's so disappointing to hear that it's still prevalent that people have still got this microaggression to them. But how do you deal with that? Um, so you you have to pick your battle. So you have to sort of sit and and think about whether a particular microaggression is something that you want to pick up and take forward or not or whether you just let it lie because it's, you know, you've got bigger fish to fry, for example. So mm -hmm. I, the way, I guess the way you deal with it is you, you keep focused on what your journey is and what you want to achieve and, and what you want to get out of, out of career and, and work, basically. Mm -hmm. So the way I think about it is I'm here to inspire the next generation. I'm trying to create a path for them. So I will very selectively pick up certain microaggressions that I need to go and speak to the person about. For me, the biggest way to deal with the microaggression is to really go and speak to the person about it. 90% of the time, the person who is doing the microaggression probably doesn't even realize how it's coming across to you mm. so or what, what is triggering in you um, because they've not had the same lived experiences as you. And do you think um, kind of white colleagues or colleagues not from like an ethnic minority, do you think they have a role to play in science and other sectors with kind of calling people out if they observe microaggressions because it, it shouldn't be down to people to have to call it out themselves as well you should have allies there as well and hopefully you do um but yeah just to it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on what other scientists can be doing my biggest ally is my husband actually and the first time I experienced allyship was from my husband and he did it very innocently um and we just to give you a short story but we were going to watch racing we love to go and watch car racing and um, we were walking down a ramp to go into the racing stadium or the racing circuit rather and as we were walking down we both had rucksacks um, because we had our picnic with us and I was stopped and he wasn't and then he noticed you know 30 others going past mm -hmm. because usually when I go to car racing there's not many Asian people who go to car racing so so you know he suddenly asked the lady um why why have you why, why did you choose us, you know, and, and mm. why did you choose her rather? And, uh, and she's, she was a bit sort of caught out, you know, and thinking, oh, I've never been asked that before. And she says, oh, it's just random. And he says, yeah, but you've not picked anybody else. And, you know, they could have all had something in their bag. Why did you suddenly decide to pick her? I mean, she's so small as well. I mean, why did you decide to pick on her? And she didn't have an answer for it, but that was the first experience of allyship that I, I experienced. And I was, I actually didn't know what to do with it myself, you know, but I was super um, chuffed almost a little bit, you know, choked up a little bit to say, mm -hmm. oh, it's so lovely that you stood up for me, you know, kind of thing. So, so yeah, so my biggest ally, and I do think that allies are the way forward, actually. Um, I have a strong um, 
adjudication, uh, you know, I, I, I talk a lot about how to be a good ally and how to be a good mentor and things. And a lot of people, especially who are not from ethnic minority groups, feel like they can't be allies or they feel like they can't be good mentors. But I don't think that allyship and mentorship comes from the color of the skin. I think it comes from the intention of the heart and the intent, the real intent of mm. make, wanting to make a difference. So I, I do talk a lot about allyship and how we can get better at that. Um, so let's get into your research now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to read this off the script so I can get this right. <laughs> um, so your research focuses on computational studies of fundamental processes in complex materials at the atom atomic and quantum scale. Um, so we've kind of you kind of broke this down for us a little bit earlier about understanding the materials. So could you tell us about some of the specific projects you're working on at the moment, please, and kind of what they're looking to achieve? Yeah, absolutely. So fundamentally what we try and do is if you think about any material it's made up of atoms and atoms are made up of positive elect well positive so every atom will have a nucleus and it will have electrons and what we mean by the quantum scale is where we start to look at inside the atom and looking at those electrons and how they work when we talk about atomic what we mean by that is how the atoms are behaving themselves so we're not necessarily interested in what is happening inside the atom but what is happening with the atom itself. And so that's why we work at different scales. And that's what that means. Um, in terms of the projects I'm working on, so there's several, pro I work quite broadly in energy technology. So starting with my most current project is on battery materials and I work with industry a lot. So we're looking at battery anodes. So anode is a negative electrode, but it's, you know, it's, um, it's, so if you think about a battery, like a sandwich, then you've got a positive electrode and a negative electrode, and you've got some filling in the middle. So a lot of our research is either looking at the filling in the middle, which at the moment in your lithium ion battery is a liquid, or we're trying to find solids that you can use so that there's a, it's got better stability, it's got better safety, that sort of thing. Um, we're also looking at the anode because the anode particularly works with the electrolyte. And so we're trying to find if we're changing to solid electrolytes, then we need to change our, our anode as well. So that's one project. We've got another set of projects that are look. So this particular, sorry, I should say this particular battery material project is working with companies. Um, so I've worked with Johnson Mathe before and Echion Technologies at the moment. Um, we've also got PhD students who are working on this on the side. So there's lots of collaborations with Birmingham and Sheffield and, uh, and a lot of other universities around the country. My second project uh, area that I work on is actually solar cells. So we're working with CREST, which is at Loughborough Science Park, which is the Center for Renewable Energy and Sustainable Technologies. And they are ex the experimental side of looking at um, photovoltaics, so looking at solar panels. And the technology there is really next generation. So at the moment, all the solar modules that you see on top of houses and things are all made of silicon. But you need a very pure form of silicon, so it's very crystalline. As you, as the crystallinity, so as the structure of the silicon changes, the efficiency of the cell changes. So we are trying to find a new, we're trying to look at a new material, which is called cadmium telluride. And this is similar to silicon where it's very thin layers, so you can make a flat module. And the idea behind the cadmium telluride is that it's very um, processable, so it's very easy to work with. And you don't need specialist equipment, you don't need it in its purest form. So in terms of manufacturing, it reduces the cost quite dramatically. So if you're trying to find cheap solar modules so that everybody can have a solar module, or particularly places like Africa can have solar mm. um, panels on huts and things like that, or even solar farms, then this is a good way to go. So there is a few problems with the technology and we're using our computational methods to help the experimentalists to understand what is going on with their processes and how they can optimize those processes to make the cost cheaper and make it more and make it workable to increase the efficiency. The third project is on nuclear materials. So we're looking at um, radiation damage. So imagine the next generation of nuclear reactors they're being bombarded with radiation constantly because that's how nuclear energy is generated. And the idea is that we want to try and understand how those materials are damaged. So if you think about the lining inside a nuclear reactor, if it's constantly being damaged through radiation, then you don't want it to leak, right? You don't want that radiation to leak out. Um, you don't want to replace that material 
you know, every 10 years or something because the nuclear power station has to shut down. So you want to find materials that can withstand radiation damage for a good 50, 60 years, because that's how long you want the nuclear power station to keep running for. So that there's a project we're running at the moment. We just had a paper accepted, our first paper yesterday, um, which we're very proud of, um, on high, high entropy alloys. So these are metals that you would mix together. So if you think bronze is an alloy of um, copper and zinc, so you would have, instead of having just two elements, you would have four, four or five different metals that you're mixing together. And the idea is that you're trying to make materials that are going to be radiation damage resistant. So that's the third project. And my final project is on fuel cells, which is where my actual energy research started from. And that is really trying to look at, again, the filling. So fuel cell is like a battery, it's like a sandwich. And so you can have um, electrodes, positive and negative, and you can have a filling in the middle. And again, we're looking at the fillings in the middle, we're looking at the electrode materials and trying to understand how we can make them better for experimentalists, both from a manufacturing point of view or a phase, you know, making it more stable point of view or making it more efficient. So it's got higher capacity so the fuel cell can run for longer. And fuel cells have become, you know, the research has started to die, but it's now coming back up again because the UK government has now started to invest in hydrogen storage again. Right. So hydrogen storage and fuel cells would go hand in hand because that's the fuel you'd need to, to power your fuel cell. So hence my little demo that we're showing you <laughs> because it become, it's become very relevant again. Well, lots of very exciting projects. It sounds like you're improving existing kind of energy tech but also looking at how we can move towards this kind of cleaner transition, making solar more accessible. So lots of really exciting things yeah. there. It sounds like you must be a multitasking wizard as well <laughs> to have so much on the go. I hope you still have a little cat naps when you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need them. <laughs> um, so you're also um, a Royal Society Industry Fellow. Um, can you explain to listeners what a fellow is, what being part of this fellowship means? Yeah, so the fellowships generally what they mean is that you're able to you get funding and you're able to buy out some of your time so that you can spend more time doing research than you can either doing teaching or admin duties at, at the university. So my fellowship is with industry, so it means that 50% of my time in this instance um, should be spent <laughs> doing work for the industry, but of course it doesn't quite it's not that clean cut. So at the moment I spend I, I travel one day a week um, and I spend one day a week or about one day a week um, working from home for this company where we're specifically looking at projects and problems that they have on battery anodes uh, for high power applications to try and see if we can help them to look at their materials in a different way or optimize the materials um, for future proofing or you know increasing capacity or stability, et cetera. So what a fellowship means is basically that you have time to do research, uh, which you have bought out from the university to be able to do that. I'm just lucky that mine's industrial. So the work that I'm doing is very relevant because it's going to be the really the next generation. It's not, really, it's not fundamental research. It's actually relevant now, if that makes sense. All right. Uh, thank you for that explanation. I don't think we've ever discussed being a fellow on this show. So it's nice to kind of explain yeah. to people what that means. Um, so you're also the School of Sciences Director of Equality and Diversity. Um, what does that role entail? It means is basically trying to look at um, strategies and looking at the School of Science strategy around um, equity, diversity and inclusion, or even equality, diversity and inclusion. So could involve anything from data gathering, whether to find out where, where the gaps are, what we need to improve on, what we need to do better, to um, introducing staff to inclusive practice and what that might look like, to challenging senior management, um, you know, to say, why have you done certain things in a certain way? Why has this decision been made in this way? Have you considered uh, what the implications might be for a particular group of underrepresentative groups, things like that. So um, so I sit on the senior management team, um, which is the deanery basically. So I sit with the deans and with the dean and the associate deans, et cetera, and the heads of department and try and work out some of these things and work with them to 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 make to make science a better place really. And I think this is quite an obvious answer given what you've just said, but um 
not just Loughborough, but kind of across the, the, the board with science, do you think there are still kind of major issues with uh, diversity, inclusivity, equity, um, equality? Do, do you think there are still issues there? And if so, can you kind of pinpoint some? Um, and also any thoughts that you have on how we can tackle this? Um, especially like you said white allies and other white people working in science what what can be done yeah absolutely so definitely room for improvement um there's there's so much to do in this area it's unreal it's quite overwhelming sometimes um where are some of these issues um so we seem to have a leaky pipeline the data is very evident now it's very clear that we have a leaky pipeline i think schools have done a great job and the education sector, much lower down, has done a great job of uplifting their diversity. Um, and, you know, the schools have become much more accessible, they're a bit more fairer, etc. Coming on to GCSEs and A-levels, so further education, I think a lot of work has been done in that section as well. And so when we look at students who come into university, we're getting a good 50, at least in chemistry, and I think now in most science subjects, we'll get a good 40 to 60 percent ratio, a 40, 60 ratio of male, female, uh, for example, colleagues, you know, students will get in some cases 50, 50 in a good year. So the numbers are looking good in that sense. Where are we starting to fall down a little bit, for example, if we look at those, if we look at the data is that we don't have as many students from, let's say, black and minority ethnic groups, we don't have a lot of disability students who are taking on sciences, um, LGBTQ plus is also another area that needs work, um, and there's a lot of um, things around, you know, mature students are also less in science generally, things like that. So. Um, there's lots of things that we need to work on where the data is showing that we, we need to improve. Um, when we take the pipeline from A levels to arriving at university, we're doing okay. So our, our numbers of black students, for example, has gone up, numbers are increasing, which is good. That's all looking great. But then when we look at the attainment gap, um, when they leave university, that is dropping for certain groups. And so there's clearly a lot of work that we need to do at university to address why that is happening, because we've clearly addressed it at further education so that they are now achieving those grades to come to university. So they're coming to university with the same grades as every other student from, let's say, a white privileged background, but then they're not leaving with similar grades. They're actually the attainment. Right. Is so that is very clear. The, the data is there. We do not need to collect more data. It's very evident. But then if you look at the number of then people going into academia or jobs or, you know, high, high paid jobs and things like that, or technological jobs, you see another drop from underrepresented groups. And so is that because their attainment gap is lower, right? Is, or the attainment mm -hmm. gap is higher? I mean, is it because that they're not getting the same, they're not coming out with the same degree classifications as they come? Right. So is that the problem or is it that, um, you know, they're just moving on because they've got other cultural things that are barriers to entry, et cetera. So there's a whole plethora mm -hmm. of things that mm -hmm. need to be looked at, but there is clearly a pipeline. It's either leaky or it's blocked and we need to figure out what's what's going on there. If you then look at higher levels of academia, so even within chemistry departments, if you look at the number of female professors, you look at the number of female black professors, you know, you start to build in those intersections then you start to realize we're not doing very well at all and we need to, there's a lot of work to be done it sounds like there's a lot of work to be done and how do we go about that is it researching is it talking to people i'm just wondering what the next steps are because i always hear we, we need to do more what what kind of do you think is the, um, the kind of route to take there so i think there's several ways that we can do this and there's i mean there's discussions about this at all levels at the moment mm. um so there's different ways you can do it. One is valuing the staff that you have already, right? So the people you have, try and keep them on because you want to keep the diversity going and they need to feel valued and supported and respected. Quite often you'll find those people are fighting big battles. As you said, you know, constantly <laughs> microaggressions here and there. They're the ones who are bringing up challenging situations. And so, you know, it's, it's difficult to keep them going because at, at some point the energy will drain off you know and 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 it's 
they'll either leave the, the area or they'll um, they'll move into a different career path, whatever. Or they're burnt out. It, it, that's just how it is. So we need to we need to value the people we have. We need to give them the space and the energy to and the time to actually do do what share their lived experiences. Um, talk to the senior management, talk to those allies. They need to be given the space and time to do that. They need to be recognized for doing that, taking on those burdens, right? Uh, generally, you'll find there'll be quotas that we put on saying certain committees need to have certain number of females, certain females of certain background, you know, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And these are burdens, right? Because it means that I have to then sit on committees. So there's almost a positive right. discrimination going on. Got you. Um, so there is, there's that to tackle as well. And then at the senior management levels, I think that we need to be more open to challenging, be, be open to the fact that people are challenging you. This is a good thing that, you know, they want to try and fix it. So listen to those people who are challenging you. I think we need to be open to change and learning. I'm always learning. I, I don't have all the answers just because I'm brown and I'm female. I'm learning constantly. I was in a women in chemistry conference yesterday and I learned so much from just being present. So I think being open to change and being open to learn um, is, is, is something that I think universities and schools and I think any industry needs to do more. And I think reflecting on current practice to say, where is the bias in our practice? Where is the bias in our procedures? How inherent are those and how are we going to make big changes? I think we've done all the small tick box changes, low hanging right. has been taken. I think now we really want to see step change, you know, where somebody is really taking it and saying, no, let's just throw this whole thing away and let's just start again, you know, and, and let's not have a bias and let's not think about historically how things were done. And then suddenly you'll start to see some changes. But in order for that to happen, we need some brave leadership and some brave leadership that is happy, that is not happy, but um, willing to be vulnerable because I think they need to be in that vulnerable position in order to, for the change to happen. This is by no means easy because mm. if it was easy, we would have done it already. Yeah, well, hopefully there will be brave leadership and we'll see some positive changes yes. soon. Oh, but very nice. that's really fascinating to kind of hear your thoughts on what's next and what needs to happen. So thank you for that. And with this podcast, I will make sure we have hyperlinks for people to kind of, if they wish, like you said, to carry on learning, to educate yourselves. Um, and yeah. We'll try and kind of pull together some of the university's resources so people can educate themselves and make a start. Yeah. Um, so we've just covered your kind of school EDI role. Um, and I believe that you are also, are you sit on a Royal Society committee as well. Can you tell me a bit about that, please? Yeah, so I got elected onto the Royal Society of Chemistry uh, Inclusion and Diversity uh, Committee. And they have been super active in, in the whole EDI space for chemical sciences. So they've just brought out lots of reports on sense of belonging, for example. There's another one that's coming out this week, I believe, on uh, missing elements. So talking about, um, you know, th what, what's missing at the moment to make um, chemical sciences more inclusive. And, uh, you know, they've had a whole big report on breaking the barriers, for example, for women. Um, things like that so it's really an exciting time to join the committee actually and the fact that people elected me to be on you know the member community um, elected me to, to be on on there as a as an elected member was was uh, incredibly uh, honoring should we say <laughs> or humbling <laughs> rather um, so yeah so I do that and I also sit on the research council um, EDI strategic advisory group so I've just joined that group so we are there, there at the moment trying to look at how research grant funding and how the research councils can do better in this space. Because again, the data is very evident that um, you know, women, for example, get less grants than men. Black, black professors get less grants than white professors. Um, you know, things like that. So if you're sitting at, if you're a black female, for example, <laughs> you know, the numbers are not, they don't even exist on the database. That's how low it is. So um, so yes, but at least, I mean, I guess. This all sounds very gloom, but the positive thing is that they are thinking about it. There's conversations that are happening. Um, we've done very well in the gender area. So we now see a lot of women sitting on good boards and leadership positions. So that's been happening. A lot of them are white women. So now we need to address a little bit of this intersection, right? So if you're black and female, if you're black and male, that sort of thing. So 
So there is lots of conversations happening and it's really interesting to be part of those conversations. And it's nice that they've got representatives and I'm actually quite honored that I've been given a seat on the table to have to voice my, my opinions. So that's quite nice. Um, so moving on now to a kind of quick fire round, which is one of my favorite segments <laughs> Can be of the quick. show. <laughs> it doesn't have to be super quick, don't worry. Um, so what would you say is the most exciting part of being a material scientist? discovering I think curiosity discovering new materials just finding a solution to a problem um, you know helping helping industry that sort of thing is really the most exciting part of my job great answer uh, um, and then not so glamorous parts grant writing and grant reflection <laughs> <laughs> is not so glamorous yeah well. yeah we get that answer quite a bit and also kind of like just admin side of things we often yeah. hear as well I don't mind the admin side. I also don't mind dealing with students. I think that's uh, that's the fun. That's still fun for me. Um, but for me, the grant writing is a proper grind. How do you deal with um, kind of grant rejection? Because I can only imagine I that for a month, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> I sit and cry. I, I oh, no. just cry. <laughs> oh, and then I pick myself up and and, and carry on. <laughs> carry on. That's good. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine putting all that effort into an application, thinking this is it, and then the rejection. But um, now you've got to, just got to keep pushing what you believe in. So, no. Um, what's the weirdest thing you've had to do as part of your job? So this is a tricky one for me, because what does weird mean? Um, um, so I guess the, the, the type of stuff that I do, being computational, um, and working with industry. So a lot of computational research is at very at the fundamental level. So most mm -hmm. people, it's very hard to engage with industry when you're doing things like computational chemistry right, or, or computational material science. So I think the fact that a lot of my funding has come from industry, it's very applicable. Um, that is different. Um, from, a, from a more sort of academic perspective, I guess, you know, um, talking to students, uh, pastoral care, that, that is, you know, when I have to talk mm -hmm. to students about self-harming and, and suicide watch and, and, and things like that, that is, I'm out of my depth, I, I can tell you. Um, and usually I'm very, I'm very grateful to the wellbeing advisors for taking, taking over because, you know, they have the qualifications, they're the experts. Um, so, so that sort of stuff is for me weird. Um, right. But, you know, where I'm out of my depth. But in terms of funny, weird, um, you know, I do things like this. I go and talk, I, I take <laughs> Sam and Eddie to lectures. And I, I talk to students as if I'm doing a puppet show. Um, you know, these sort of, these are the sort of things we do that are weird, you know, yeah. uh, which are fun actually. So, so that's quite nice. Who's your favorite, Sam or Eddie? I think Eddie is, Eddie is, I don't know if you can tell, but so this is Eddie and this is Sam. And if you look very carefully, one of them looks older than the other. So he's yeah. wiser and older <laughs> and, younger and more delinquent. So I, I love, love that. Them, but I love Sam because he's so naughty all the time. I love that they've got a personality. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite project to date? I think my current project at the moment, working with this company is my favorite project. Um, one, because it's working on current technology too, because I love, it's a brand new experience for me. You know, I go into the company once a week. Um, I'm hoping to increase that to twice a week. And, you know, it's a small startup company. You're learning about the business end of things. I'm learning about what their challenges are on a day-to-day -day basis. They're very fast paced because they want results very quickly. So it, it's, it's pressured, but it's a good pressure you know, and, and you feel relevant, right? So when you're doing research, a lot of your work is papers, which might mm. be read a couple of hundred times, but this is properly relevant, you know, industry are interested in what I'm doing. So this is my most favorite project to date, I would say. That's awesome that you're currently working on your most favorite. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, so do the same things that inspired you to get into this role still inspire you? So I fell into academia by mistake is the way I, I describe it. And the reason I say that is because I only did a PhD so I wouldn't get deported. I only did a postdoc so I wouldn't get deported. I only did a second postdoc so I wouldn't get deported. And, you know, and, it's so, and so on it went. And by the time I finished my third postdoc, 
I was already labeled an academic and it was too late to right. go elsewhere. Um, and so when I th when you say, you know, inspired to get me into academia, well, thank you, British Home Office, for <laughs> sort of inspiring me to become an academic. Are they the same things that keep me motivated and driven? Actually, I think my focus in the last two years, and COVID has probably played a bit of a role in this, as well as, you know, global events, global climate change, all of this has played a bit of a role in this, is I used to be very driven and I was very determined to sort of, you know, get that big grant and, and sort of move forward in that way. I think for me, um, I've, I've sort of reflected on that a little bit during COVID and I've really thought about what I want my legacy to be as a, as a human being, but also as a scientist and things. And my focus has changed from wanting to be this super duper professor, scientist, untouchable Nobel laureate type person mm -hmm. um, to being actually the person who's inspiring the next generation. So my focus has changed a little bit, hence entering the EDI space, hence doing a little bit more in the outreach space. Because what I actually love doing, the, the biggest moments for me is when I'm teaching and, and, you know, when I'm inspiring that next generation and I see that light bulb, you know, going up and going super excited about yeah. getting it working and things. And so for me, that is the real pleasure of my job. So no is the answer the short answer to your question is, is the same things that motivate you know that got me into the job still motivate me no my focus has totally changed I think that's brilliant and I I can confidently say you, you are definitely an inspiration I think your story is great everything you stand for is great your research is awesome so you're achieving that um so what's your dream or goal for your career like your ultimate dream I mean, ultimately, we want to become a professor, right? I mean, yeah, <laughs> you want those four letters before you. So that is one. That is the sort of factual sort of point to the point. I'd like to be a prof. Um, other than that, what what I I think my dream or goal is, and this is the legacy, is really to have, you know, to, to look back and to say, you know, and to keep in touch with the people that I inspire now and that I talk to and motivate and keep in science. Mm -hmm. And look back and look at their careers and go, I had a teeny weeny weeny bit of a bit to do with that, you know. And and that I think that that for me is is what I'd like my dream and my legacy to be. I like that. Um, and what does a material scientist do in their spare time? So this material scientist um, <laughs> does a lot of baking. I love baking mm. and cooking. Uh, the kitchen is my therapeutic unit is what I call it um, and usually when I've had a bad day I sort of go in and close the door and then two hours later I've made a meal. <laughs> enough 50 probably so I love cooking I love baking that's where I do my real chemistry um, and then I, I love going cycling uh, I'm a road cyclist and I love gardening and growing my own vegetables because I think there's so much science in that um, mm. so there's lots of things I get involved with uh, outside material science but yeah and I am um, I've got to ask about Dobby and Yoda as well in the corner of your room um are, are you are you fans of Harry Potter Star Wars that kind of thing I am uh so I, I haven't read all the Harry Potter books but I I do love the films and I think one of my favorite characters in in Harry Potter is actually Dobby um you know he's just he's just he's just lovable I love I love mm -hmm. his uh, nature and, and his personality so that's why I've got Dobby there in the corner and Yoda up on this corner um was actually a gift uh, a leaving gift from my fourth position which was in Huddersfield and the reason for that was when I started in Huddersfield I was very as I said I'm very short so I'm, I'm four foot eleven and when I was teaching the students had uh, nicknamed me Yoda, which I didn't know about until one of my colleagues was saying that I was going to take his class. And, and they were like, oh, you mean Yoda? And <laughs> so this is where it all started from. And so the next time I went into the class, I actually bought a lightsaber from one of these, you know, festivals. Amazing. And I lectured with my lightsaber. <laughs> so the message got across that I knew I was being called Yoda. And then when I left, um, my colleague bought me a little plush toy of Yoda. So, um, oh, that's awesome. That's where come from. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so we, we've kind of discussed the projects you're working on, but what would you say is next for you? So I'm actually at the cusp of my career right now where I'm thinking about, um, you know, do I want to carry on with the research side of things? Do I want to go down a teaching route? Do I want to go down a leadership management route? 
Um, so I'm kind of at that cusp, but I think for me at the moment, the focus is to try and get, get that prof. So it's still about research, writing grants, being successful in that space. By and large, I want to still, I found my love for working on problems that are real and at cutting edge research. So I want to work with industry a lot more. So I'm sort of pushing in that direction um, and it being a bit more enterprisal. So with that comes, you know, the training for being a leader, being a man, being a good manager. So that's that that's where I see myself next is sort of heading in those sort of um, leadership management roles. But more importantly, at the moment, the, so the near future focus is on, on trying to become prof or, or getting promoted to the next level. And kind of talking about the future, what do you think the hot topics in, will be in material science, science for like future scientists? Are we looking more towards kind of clean energy materials or what are your thoughts there? So clean energy materials for sure, as I said, hydrogen technology is now being invested in very strongly. So, you know, that's a good area to go into. I think solar is becoming back fashionable. So I think that's an area. I think with material science, hot topics tend to change a lot. And, and you can span from healthcare technology. So material scientists are equally important because of COVID. You know, COVID is viruses, antivirals, antibacterial. This is all material science. So you don't need to only think about it from an energy point of view. But I think with global climate change coming up, I think energy is a hot topic. So for me, healthcare, energy um, are the two main technologies, if you like, or the main two areas where hot topics will come up. Um, just because health and disease is something that we're dealing with on a daily basis, COVID has proven how vulnerable we are as a society. And then energy is also proving how vulnerable we are. If you think about all the, all the you know, floods and mm -hmm. earthquakes and things that we're having and how we deal with that. So even building, even from a building and construction point of view, you can see how material scientists are really critical mm -hmm. because you can find materials that can withstand earthquakes, for example. Then you start to see how you, your work becomes a hot topic suddenly. Really interesting. Um, so... Do you have any words of wisdom for kind of students inspiring to be like you or are, any, are there any words of wisdom that you wish your younger self could have heard? So I think I did hear them. I heard them from my mother and she's my biggest sort of inspiration. <clears throat> I talk about lots of professors and things, but actually the real person who believed in me was my mother and my father. Um, so believe in yourself. I did hear that when I was younger, not from my teachers necessarily, but from my parents. So um, just because they're not educated doesn't mean that they don't have aspirations, they don't believe in you. So really believe in yourself. I, surround yourself with people who believe in you and believe that you are going to do well because you need that. You need that support to be able to do well. Um, and always ask for help. I, I feel like if I had asked for help sooner, then I might have been a bit further along my career path. So my advice is always, you know, we always feel like we'll just carry on and we'll just keep going and we'll keep struggling on and, you know, and things like that. But you don't need to actually asking for a little bit of help sooner, especially I think women, we find it hard to ask for help. We always want to be seen as coping and well managing. Um, I think asking for help soon will help you, will be better. And why do you think ultimately people should consider a career in science? So apart from the fact that most scientific jobs play, pay well <laughs> and are very stable jobs to have, um, you know, if you think about if you what, what you want your legacy to be, or you, you know, if I'm talking to a young person, then if you are somebody who, who likes to solve problems, then if you think about any of the global challenges that we have at the moment, if you think, go from disease to food shortages to water sanitization which are all very relevant at the moment okay we might not have the issues in britain but we do have them in other parts of the world you know food food shortages water sanitization is still a big problem in africa and in the, in other countries energy global climate change whatever you do science is going to solve the problem it has historically and it will continue in the future as well so science and engineering you know, are the pinnacle, are the underpinning of, of solving global challenges and making us as a human race where we are today. And there's no reason why that's going to change anytime soon. You know, we're not going to suddenly have something else that's going to come and solve all these problems. It's the scientists who are going to solve the problems. And if you think about 
our most recent pandemic, it is the science scientists who solve the problem. Mm -hmm. We are able now to not wear masks and walk around freely and almost consider COVID as now gone because of the science, the science made that happen. So I think if you are inclined to, to tackle some of the global challenges, even in your small way, even in a small way, you know, even with the slightest amount of research, you can you can have a big impact. Um, so why should you do science? Because you can solve problems and you can make the world a better place for everyone. I think if that hasn't sold it to people, I don't know what will. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and have a couple with me. Um, before we go, is there anything you would like to plug or like website or Twitter or any papers? So if people want to follow me, I'm on Twitter at uh, CM underscore Dr. P or to be fair, there's only one Puja Goddard in the world. <laughs> <laughs> the one and only. One and only. And she lives, you know, she she works in Loughborough. Um, I also have a website, PujaGoddard.com. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not on TikTok. I need to figure that one out yet. <laughs> um, I am on Instagram and it's the same as my Twitter account. So if you just um, look for me, you can find me. So. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you all for listening or watching this episode of Couple with a Scientist. We hope you found it interesting and will join us again. Do leave a comment and get in touch. I'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts on who you'd like to see on the show. And make sure you don't miss a show by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other mainstream podcast platforms. You can also subscribe to the Loughborough University YouTube channel if you prefer to watch the show. See you next time for more hot tea and even hotter stories to help you on your way to becoming a scientist. <laughs> <laughs>